We're uh, going to be talking today about how to build amazing user interfaces and apps using HTML5. And um, just a quick introduction, my name is Alex Fishman. I'm the Director of User Experience at uh, OpenTV Nagra. This is Isaac Chellin. He's our UEX engineer. Hello. And, and uh, we are part of the UEX studio at Nagra. Isaac and I have a kind of very specific role there where we don't deal with current products as much as kind of uh, next gen. So it's kind of, um, you know, we're, we're pretty lucky. We get to kind of think about what's coming next and f kind of future concepts and detach ourselves from the real world of kind of, um, you know, internet bandwidth speeds and things like that a little bit to really try to dream a little bit more. So it's definitely a, a fun thing to do. So just quickly uh, talk, to talk about what we do in the UEX team. Uh, we're definitely not just a design studio. We really consider ourselves TV experts. We definitely um, do visual design. It's one of our things, but we've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, and there's a lot of important things that our operators ask for that are outside of visual design itself. Things like how do we deal with um, advertising in, in an interface and make it a smooth, blended experience that doesn't, isn't very obnoxious and in your way. Things like how to deal with image metadata. Um, recommendations is a hot topic. Social. and. There's a lot of people that are out there trying to tackle these, and um, it's definitely one of those things where we've been thinking about it for a long time. We also um, are really heavy on innovation. As I mentioned, Isaac and I are, are really kind of focused on future concepts, so we're constantly filing patents and thinking about um, you know, kind of where things are going, and it's a, it's a really exciting thing. So to kind of get into what we're going to be talking about today, um, sometime late last year, our boss kind of called us into a room, and he, get, he posed a challenge for us, and he said, Basically, he wanted us to create an amazing interface for 4K. And there was a few technical requirements that, that he posed to us. The first one was that it had to be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. No flash, nothing, no cheating. We really had to make it kind of, it had to run in a browser and be HTML. The other thing is 4K resolution. So this, is, this was a fir you know, first of its kind thing, 3840 by 2160 resolution. Getting things to move around the screen at that, re at that res is something that was really uh, posed a challenge for us. And it was one of those things where we, we really had to sit down and kind of map it out and figure out how we're going to make this work without everyone, everything kind of looking very slow. And at the same time, you have this giant screen. It doesn't make sense necessarily just to take an interface and scale the whole thing up. There's really a new ways that you can look at that screen real estate and figure out how to kind of put the content on the screen and, and uh, you know, create a new experience that way. And I think you're going to see that we really kind of uh, did, a, did something unique with that. Of course, exceptional visual design, you know, it had to look pretty, so that's kind of a given. Um, advanced content discovery, so I'm going to get into some of the feature set that we kind of thought through, but things like how to put recommendations front and center, social discovery, and other elements like that were one of the things that we really thought through a lot. And then also, like I mentioned, solving key operator pain points, like how do you, you know, put advertisements front and center without being obnoxious, et cetera. So we kind of um, gathered around, and we went into uh, what we call our war room. And we kind of thought about uh, TV and it, the evolution of it. And we, we said, you know what, what's, what's different about TV nowadays? And what, what's going to allow us to not just upscale an existing interface, but think about new ways to explore and discover and use the screen real estate? And really what, we came, what it came down to was choice. So if you think about the evolution of TV, it's really um, complicated nowadays. You have live TV, you have recordings, you have on demand. There's all these apps, there's your photos, there's your music, there's so many things. I mean, and this, this image kind of um, captures it in an interesting way for me, where you can see the consumption of all these different content sources, NBC, Disney, there's things like Netflix and YouTube now as well. There's also all these d devices, so it's not just choice of content, but it's choice of device for consumption as well. So we're really being inundated, inundated with choice. And we said, how can we make an interface that really kind of um, takes advantage of this and helps you find the things that are most important to you amongst all those millions of pieces of content and gets rid of all the noise? So we kind of thought back to the beginning of TV. So we, you, know, you kind of think back to like the howdy doody. There was one channel. There was no choice. You, you basically had one thing to watch. And in a way, that was almost pleasant because you didn't have to think about what you were going to watch. It was like, here you go. You can watch it or not. And I'm kind of putting it in the context of this 84-inch screen just to see just how the resolution has kind of upgraded over the years. So this is kind of in context. The screen was about this size. And then as time went on, eventually we got to a DVD quality video. This is you know, sometime in the late 80s. Once again, you see just how small it is. And the choices did start to increase. You had now live TV, and you, you had the ability to record content. So your choice starts to slowly increase. With time, as time goes on, you, you get into HD. So now we have 1080p. And you can see in the context of, of a, this 84-inch screen, still only taking up one quarter of the screen. 
once again, more choice comes into play. You have your live TV, you have your recordings, now you also have on-demand content and the, the evolution of TV starting to get into applications and things like that. And then we come to 4K. So now we get this beautiful picture that fills up the entire screen, 3840 by 2160 resolution. And it's a great thing visually, but at the same time, we are now being inundated with so much content and so many choices that we really wanted to say, what can we do to really make this a pleasant experience without you feeling overwhelmed? So you can kind of even take it further and you could take this one 3840, 2160, you break it back into quadrants. This is actually four 1080p videos that you can simultaneously view on this screen. You break it back one level further, you can actually view 16 DVD quality videos on the same screen. So you could see <laughs> that it's really letting you watch a lot of things, but it starts to get more and more overwhelming. Let's take it back even one more step. And man, you have so much content now, but you get this, you get this feeling that's, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious here that you're starting to feel very kind of uh, intimidated by this. There's not any, anything here necessarily that you can pull out and say, hey, I'm gonna watch this right here, right? So we said, what are we gonna do here to kind of make this not intimidating? And we thought the answer was organization. So if you take this kind of mosaic of content and you organize it, it does something like this, right? Suddenly it's starting to feel a little better. You now are taking all of your content and you're organizing it into stacks. You can pick an individual stack out and now, for example, if this is an on-demand catalog, I just pulled out all my action movies. It starts to get a little bit easier. So we, we started feeling really comfortable with this concept of organization via stacks. So we said, all right, we got that covered. Now, the interface model itself, we really thought about zoomable interface. So really kind of using a camera in 3D space and putting everything in context. So you can see from full screen video, you can zoom out one level and you can see that video in, in what we call a media card. You zoom out one more level and you can see kind of all the content in a particular stack that you chose. You zoom out one more level and you have all your stacks. So at any point in time, you can kind of come in and out to the interface, but it's always contextual. So you always kind of feel like you know where you are. After that, we said, all right, we, we, we got this kind of, uh, we're feeling pretty good about this. We started to wireframe. So this is the point where we're getting closer to kind of approaching Isaac and saying, all right, you know, here's what we're looking for. What can you do for us? So you can see the wireframes we start to develop. We're starting to get a, a kind of a natural flow that's making sense. We're kind of thinking about how much content we're gonna be able to put on the screen at one time. What's the right number of items? And you know, there's all this other stuff that's off screen, but it's still there. We started getting to more visual wireframing, so it's starting to mature a little bit and mature a little bit. And at this point, we're starting to feel pretty comfortable about our interface model, so now we kind of move to feature set. Oh, sorry, one more thing is the, the content formation. So these are all the different view types that we thought would make sense in this kind of camera-based, zoomable interface, stack-based. So these are all the, the um, formations that we posed to Isaac and said, you know, what can we build here, what's realistic? And of course, not all of them made it, but most of them did, and that's you know, a lot of credit to Isaac on that one. <laughs> so then uh, we said, all right, let's look at feature set. What is this interface gonna need to kind of go through these millions of pieces of content, bring everything that you want to the forefront and get rid of everything else? The first thing is what we call our anticipation engine. It's, it's basically a level of intelligence that we gave to the interface. So it's learning about you over time and it's figuring out what you like and what you don't like. It's based on time of day, based on who's watching, profiles. And over time, it's really gonna start saying, you know, there's, a, there's all these things that you can watch, but you, we know you're not interested in that, so let's take these three things and put them on the screen for you. And you'll see an example of that when we show our interface. The next thing is social discovery. So we've really um, been thinking about social for a long time, and there's a lot of different ways that people are approaching it. The thing that we're really excited about social is the fact that people know you much better than an algorithm. Your friends really kind of, you know, especially friends that you've had for a long time, they really know what kind of things you're into, what your hobbies are, what kind of content you like to watch. So we feel like there's no better source than one of your friends to actually point you to a piece of content. Collections is this concept where you can take any topic or keyword, anything that interests you and turn it into a channel. So instead of going to NBC, CBS, or ABC now, I can actually create, like, a, you know, I'm really into the San Francisco Giants, I can create a Giants channel. Every time there's a new game on, it's gonna be added to my channel, but also maybe there's an interview with Buster Posey on a radio show, it's gonna, that's gonna be put on my channel. So everything related to that team is actually gonna be dynamically put in in real time, and then every time I go back to that channel, I'm constantly finding new things that are in that particular keyword, keyword or topic of interest. Trending analytics, what's hot? This is something that of course is uh, you know, just a really interesting gauge of, of user behavior. So not only globally, like let's say there's uh, you know, an Academy Award show or something and you totally for forgot about it, but by going to this trending kind of map, you can see that all these people are recording this event and it's kind of a good reminder for you to you know, basically tune to that or maybe even set an auto record for you so that you don't miss it. 
Scenographic trick modes is kind of the last thing that we were thinking about. Um, we're really kind of looking at this screen space and saying, instead of just using like a scrubbing 2x, 4x, let's go into visual thumbnails. It's a really fun way to explore content, especially not only from one content piece to the next, but inside of a movie or show by itself, all the scenes. So you're gonna see an example of all these uh, things in our interface that we show you in a few minutes, but this is kind of uh, the bundle that we came up with in terms of the interface model and then also the feature set. And we took all this to Isaac and we said, all right, here's what we're going for. You know, uh, how realistic is this? Are we crazy? What can we do here? And of course, with those things that we mentioned, it's gotta be all HTML running and uh, I'll show you what kind of Isaac came up with. Mind uh, switching the inputs? Sure. No problem. So yeah, they came to me with quite a challenge and um, I didn't really have a choice. I had to build it. <laughs> but um, so I'm kind of going to talk about this from the engineer's perspective, kind of what Alex just went through before and talk about the, um, so we'll start initially with the design challenges very simply as I saw as an engineer. We have a ton of space. How do we fill it? Okay, we filled it. How do we navigate it? So we got this stuff. And, and to simplify what Alex went through, they came up with a system where we had uh, a bunch of elements. The elements could be non-homogenous. So they could be video elements. It could be a stack of video elements, but it could also be video, element, video movies, TV, um, YouTube, uh, home content like photos and home movies all mixed into a stack right there. Once you hit that stack, you come in, it comes forward in 3D space and you have this wall uh, of content. So when looking at this, we have uh, presented with several challenges. Many of the, those challenges were one, uh, one that was a 3D interface, which is uh, more difficult to do in HTML, which is not designed for it. Um, two, we have a lot of content that needed to animate and animate smoothly. Again, HTML was not created for animation. Um, I talked about the non-homogeneous content. We needed a way to dynamically update uh, these elements on screen and it had to be very fast. And also we needed to take these elements that were at one point in 3D space very tiny on the screen and bring them up to full screen and have that look good. So I'll talk a little bit about our solution. The first one, uh, sort of a little metaphor. When looking at all these elements on the screen, I thought about the actors on the stage. And, I, and so when I come up, came up with my process, I thought about, okay, if I want to create this, I'm going to take the actors, then I'm going to send them to the wardrobe, they're going to costume, and then they're going to go to the director and get their positions, and then they're going to take their positions on the stage. And I used this um, as sort of my guideline for coming up um, with this simple class diagram, um, which is a uh, sort of a, an extension of MVC. Um, with some added components, um, added in a, um, a skinning component so for the dynamic updating. Um, and I also added in a, a layout element for being able to have dynamic position changing on the view. Um, the next step was, was animating all this content. Looked at uh, several different ways to animate in HTML. Uh, the first way with CSS is to actually define the transitions within the style sheet itself. That works pretty well, but it's not, it's, not, it's not great when you want to animate a lot of content. So we had to, couldn't use that. Uh, what seemed to work best was to dynamically apply CSS styles using JavaScript. Uh, and specifically to use the matrix 3D transformation property. Uh, this allowed you um, to define all your transformations, scale, rotate, uh, translate in, in one, um, one process rather than applying them in steps. So there was uh, efficiency there. Um, it was OK to use Translate Scale 3D, but it added a couple more steps to the process. Uh, and the next thing that was very important is to, um, is to make sure you use the request animation frame when doing your rendering. Uh, request animation frame um, only calls your render callback when the browser is ready to paint. Uh, this is uh, the older method in HTML for animation was to use a timer object um, and you would set your timer to do a callback every X amount of milliseconds. The problem with that is sometimes the browser wasn't actually ready to draw the screen and you had a wasted cycle. And the last thing I'm going to talk about how the, the templating structure worked for this, which was kind of different. Uh, in this we had, a, um, we had our view, your view object, or it could be the, let's say the, um, your view object was a, a VOD movie. Uh, when it made its call to render to the screen, it would go and call render and would call the skin manager. 
the view would pass a little piece of data with it. It would pass some template data uh, for what was supposed to appear in the view, and it would pass um, uh, information about its skin. It would go to the skin manager, which would then retrieve a snippet of code, a package, which is a little bit of HTML and a little bit of CSS. It would then take takes this data, it takes this template data, that HTML package or skin package, and passes it to a template utility, which then binds that data to the HTML and then inserts it into the DOM. It also looks at the CSS styles, checks to see if that CSS style is already applied into the DOM. If it isn't inserted, if not, just ignore it. Uh, and now I'll talk a little bit about when we went through the limitations of, of CSS that we came across. Um, one is that uh, for efficient animation, you're really limited to uh, translations, rotations, scales, and opacity changes. Any of the other sort of um, effects that you would get with CSS that are kind of cool, like drop shadows, glow effects, any of the filter effects uh, really hinder animation performance and really can't be used. You can apply them after your, trans your transitions, but um, not during transitions. Uh, the, and lastly, they, um, you're also just limited to using HTML elements, which basically means everything's in a square. You're limited to image tags, div tags, video tags. And while you can do a lot, and I think for most interfaces, this is actually plenty, um, there, are, there are things that it can't do, and, and um, it's always nice to see if you can let the designers go for with their imagination what they can come up with. Um, now that I've talked a little bit about from the engineering side, um, Alex is going to turn it over to Alex to actually demo the UI, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about what we're working on now um, with WebGL. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so this is Ultra. This is kind of uh, the end result of everything that we, that we kind of thought through, gave to Isaac, and here's uh, what he was able to develop for us, and it's something that we're really proud of and I'm excited to show it to you guys. So it's a profile-based system, so in this case, I'm gonna log in, and um, let's, let's log in as one of the users. What happens now is I'm exploding out my content universe. So this is actually, we're really using 3D space to its fullest. You can see here that this is a completely passive viewing experience at this point where I'm actually not navigating at all. I'm kind of just sitting back on my couch and relaxing. And it's that anticipation engine that I was referring to earlier, which is actually bringing content to the forefront for me that it thinks I really want to watch at this exact moment. So it knows I was in the Mad Men, but I didn't click anything, so it went away. There's this new game that just came out, but I'm not really interested in this either, so it's going to go away. Everything's kind of giving me a five second preview, and if I hit select at any time, I can go full screen on it. Now, one other thing that's interesting about this is that we're really utilizing 3D space where the things that are the closest to you in 3D space are the ones that it thinks are the most relevant to you. And everything that's kind of way in the back, it's still in your universe, but it doesn't feel like you want to watch it at that, at that time, so you kind of can't even see it. It's really kind of buried back there. This is a really kind of uh, difficult thing to navigate, so we do have a method where if you kind of um, hit a directional button, it kind of reorganizes into a helix formation. So this does let you kind of almost navigate in, in, like, in a single strip view. So I can go one at a time. I can actually skip 20 items at a time by going down a row. And it kind of lets you uh, go through that way. But we were thinking, you know, this is very cool and, we're, and it, it's a nice use of 3D space, but it might not be the most efficient method of navigation. So this is where we bring in our organization layer. So I can bring up the main menu here. And it's a very simple main menu. And as soon as I go over to my first category, which is live TV, you can see that everything sweeps away and it comes back nice and organized as a stack. So this is, what, this is what we call our live TV stacks. So if I go into my live TV stacks, you can see I can navigate between stacks here. This is a channel-based view. All HTML, these are actually really high-res images at this resolution. It's, the performance is really something that we're, uh, we're pretty pleased with. We also have this thing we call a smart sort. So right now, I'm looking at it by time, but by hitting a sort button, I can actually switch to a channel-based view. I can hit sort again, and I can sort by alphabetical. I can do it again, and this is one that we're pretty excited about. It's actually sorting by popularity. So this is that kind of what's hot concept, where it's taking all the live TV stuff, and it's saying, here's your stack of top 50. You know, this is 51 to 100, 100 to 150. I'm not sure how many people are actually going to ever navigate past the first stack of what's hot, but it's really cool that you can kind of get a nice, organized view of the things that are most popular right now. So then if I actually want to go into a stack, I can just simply select it, and it does a nice sweep and goes into what we call our wall view. So this is where I can kind of navigate through individual items. We have this concept of the video preview throughout, where if I don't do anything for a few seconds, it automatically starts playing a preview for me. This is actually a 1920 by 1080 preview. So this is the first thing where you're really kind of getting a really good resolution look at this screen real estate without taking up the full screen. You can kind of navigate around. 
go through different pieces of content. And if you find something that you want to watch, it's going to show you a preview. And all you have to do is hit select. And I can just go full screen on it. And it's that simple. So now I'm watching the Avengers. Now if I want to find out more info about the Avengers, I can sim simply hit an info button. And now I can see a nice big box cover. I can actually scroll over and get a synopsis, really high res image, uh, really good resolution on the synopsis text so you can still read it. Cast and crew, so if I want to see what other movies Scarlett Johansson's in, I can kind of pivot that way. And then I can go into our related content as well. So this is one of, one of the things we're really putting front and center is we're trying to take related content and say, here's other movies that you might want to watch based on what you're watching right now. It's, really, it's using that same video preview concept where after a few seconds without doing anything, it goes away. I navigate over to the next one, check out Captain America, and I'm actually not that interested in watching anything else right now, so I can go ahead and exit and go back to my video. So this is a really good snapshot of kind of how we're taking individual pieces of media and showing in a stack formation all the way to a wall, all the way to a media card, and the ability to watch full screen. So we also have this kind of same concept for other, pieces, uh, other types of content as well. If I go to On Demand, you'll start to notice that it feels very consistent. There's not any more guessing that I have to do because I'm looking at a different type of uh, content. It's actually very consistent. I still have stacks. I can navigate between them. One thing that's really interesting here is I'm using that same sort button, and we're calling it a smart sort, but it's going to be a different type of sort now. So I'm not looking at times anymore because I'm not in live TV. It's actually by default going by genres. And if I sort this again, I can switch to, um, in this case, alphabetical. And one of the, the ones that's really interesting to me is the, by release year. So I can see what the latest movies are and kind of go back in time that way. So if I go into the, my on-demand stack, we have, once again, a very consistent experience. Kind of navigate down. And this is a good example of one of our 4K pieces of content. It's a nature clip. So I can go into this North America clip, go full screen, and I can show you our scenographic concept that I was describing earlier. So if I hit select at any time on full screen video, it's actually going to zoom that video back. And these are DVD quality video previews of the frame that I'm in. So if I start hitting the right key, I can actually start navigating between these frames. And I'm getting a really good sense of what's going to be in there. I'm holding it down now and then stopping. And if I hit select, then I can go full screen on that clip. And once again, like I mentioned, instead of going 2x, 4x and just kind of seeing the video scrubbing in, in this weird way, it's a really cool way to kind of visually, at DVD quality, pick where you want to be in a particular movie or show. So it almost doesn't even look like it's moving here, but you can see there's like some spider webs and like some little bugs flying around here in 4K. So moving forward, we also are dealing with not just live TV and on demand, but also things like photos. Photos is one of the ones that's really interesting to me. It's uh, very popular nowadays on your phone or tablet to you know, consume your Instagram feed or things like that. And it's a great experience, and it's a very social experience. But the one thing that's really limiting about it to me is the screen size. You know, it's, it's either a 4-inch screen or maybe a 10-inch screen. But wouldn't you much rather look at your photos on a beautiful 84-inch screen in 4K? And especially with a lot of cameras and even your phone cameras, they're actually giving you 4K resolution in the picture itself. So when you look at it on here, you're actually getting that full resolution. So if I go into a stack here, you know, this is the kid's soccer game, I can zoom it up to full screen size. And it's like, wow, that's so much better to me than looking at it on a, on a little screen. You know, I'm sitting back on my couch, I have the family around, and we can get a nice picture of my kid's soccer game from that afternoon in really high res. Moving to music, same concept. Um, we have box covers here. Uh, sorry, we have, we have uh, album covers here for music. I can sort by genre or switch to another method. You can go in, and one thing that's interesting about music to me is that we, we don't just do a visualizer here. We're actually tapping into an API to be able to pull in the music video. So if I stop on one of these videos, for example, instead of just kind of giving me the, the title of the song, it's actually going to play the video for me. And once again, this is a, a 1920, 1080 video just taking up the center of my screen. So one other concept I want to just kind of show how we pulled off is the collections. So this is the thing I was referring where you turn anything into a, uh, any, into a channel. So for me, um, you know, food and cooking is something I'm really into, gangster movies, baseball. So this is kind of the concept where we have a stack around baseball that I created. It's basically like taking a search term and creating a channel from it. So anytime there's new baseball-related content, if I come back here in two days, it's going to be a different set of movies. So anything that's kind of relevant at the time, trending content, things that are my, my friends are adding, it's all going to kind of pop into my baseball channel. So then we have our social stacks. This is um, something that I'm pretty excited about as well. So you know, the way we look at social is we don't just want to take your Facebook feed and kind of 
put, you know, show you one post at a time on your TV or your Twitter feed. It's, it's not necessarily the best way to kind of consume that content. It's much better on a computer. Here what we're doing is we're actually turning your friends into channels. So instead of just going to like my, my NBC channel, I can go to my John channel. This is one of my coworkers and I can start to getting a snapshot of the kind of content that he's into. Real genius, uh, 16 Candles. He's obviously into 80s comedies and uh, it really kind of lets me know what kind of things that he's into. And if there's a lot of movies that I'm into as well, I can actually start, I can add John as one of my channels and I know that every time I come back there, I'm gonna be getting content that's really interesting to me. Here's another one of my friends, which is uh, Elizabeth, and if I go into her stack, I can actually kind of look into the individual movies and shows that she's watching, and if I scroll to this one, I can actually see, oh, there's two people watching this right now. So that's pretty cool, and if I go full screen on this particular video, which is a puppy race, I, because there's two other people watching this, I'm actually gonna get a notification. So if you look up in the top right corner of the screen, we're gonna get a little notification here that says, hey, do you wanna join Beth and Farah and watch this together? And so if I scroll over and say join, it's letting them know that I want to join them. And it looks like uh, they've been notified. Beth is going to join me as well. And Farah is not interested. And there we go. So now Beth has joined me. And we're watching this piece of content together. So what's cool about this to me is that we have this video that's completely unobstructed. Once again, it's a 1920, 1080 video. And right next to that, this, is, this to me is a really cool social experience. So we can actually talk about it over video together. And this is kind of a, you know, we have a puppy example because it's one of our 4K clips that we were able to find. But, <clears throat> excuse me, for me, like, uh, you know, the World Cup is coming up and I think it would be such a cool thing to be able to see the match unobstructed, 1920, 1080, right in the center of the screen. And you, you might be able to surround it with five or six friends and you're all watching it together in real time, talking about it, you know, maybe a couple of you are, are rooting for the same team and you're throwing some tomatoes at the other three, like some virtual tomatoes. And the match is right in the center of the screen. So it's a really cool way to kind of take the screen real estate and this, this giant screen and, and uh, just kind of have it all there without any of it overlapping or being obstructed. So this is one of the ones that uh, we're really excited about and I think it's a, a really cool kind of uh, example of social. And the last thing I kind of want to show you guys right now is um, what, our apps. So it's one of those things where I feel like it's kind of a complicated um, thing that no one's really kind of nailed yet. I mean, uh, TV apps is something that is, is gonna be really big and it's getting bigger. You know, there's things like Roku that are, are really becoming great and other services, but one of the things that we were looking at with apps was how do we make TV-centric apps that are really just uh, you know, taking full advantage of the screen real estate. So we actually developed our own app, which we call The Buzz. So if I go into this stack, you can see the first app here is The Buzz. This is an app that we developed and that we're really excited about, which shows trending content. So it's not just sorting your stacks by popularity, but we actually have this really cool view now where there's this, if, you, if, uh, if it starts going here, we have this ambient motion that happens, so the content's kind of slowly moving, and we also have these, these kind of comment bubbles. So you can see this particular piece of content has 523, now 529 comments. It's red because there's a lot of chatter about it. This Game of Thrones show is also red because there's a lot of chatter about it. Now there's a couple of blue ones here as well, you can see those aren't being talked about as much, so we're color coding kind of the level of uh, chatter around a piece of content. And I could actually see the individual comments as well just by selecting this piece of content. I kind of blow it out now and I have a, a nice 3D view of the individual comments that are inside that bubble. So now I can see in real time as the comments come in, the ones that are closest to me, I'm, we're using 3D space again, are the most recent comments. And if I go, the ones that are kind of being pushed to the back are the earlier comments, which I don't necessarily need to see as much anymore. We have the ability to look at text comments here as well as audio and even video comments. So once again, unobstructed video in the middle and we have Beth here from our earlier video kind of dancing along to this song with us. So once again, one of the things that we're really excited about. And uh, yeah, I don't know, she's, she's a pretty good dancer, huh? <laughs> Beth was uh, pretty embarrassed to, uh, to do that for us. She's actually one of our coworkers, but she was a really good sport and uh, you know, it only took about eight or, eight or nine takes at her house to get her to be like, all right, you can, you can do that dance one. Get rid of the other, the other ones, don't put them on YouTube. So there we go, now we're back to full screen video and um, this is kind of um, where our ultra demo ends. So this is really the culmination of all, the, all of that thought, the interface model, the feature set, our conversations with Isaac, and this is uh, what we're able to create as a result of that. So now that you've seen that, I'm gonna pass it back to Isaac to, to show you, based on this, there was a lot of learnings and one of the big things that we're um, actually focusing on this year is a transition from CSS to WebGL to do some additional things like lighting, morphing and um, some other effects that we're really excited about for the kind of V2 of this. And uh, so I'll pass it back over to Isaac now. Switch our input. <laughs> <clears throat> and
And just to uh, quickly let you know, Isaac is such an HTML fiend now after this project. Even these slides are in HTML. So uh, <laughs> he's like, you're oh, ruining my reveal in a moment. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Anyway, I also want to add that uh, the, um, the Ultra demo that you just saw, which we're, of course, running on these Macintoshes right now, we're porting it right now to a set-top box. And it actually is running right now um, on OpenTV5. And we're, or I'm working on adding all these features that we've seen right now into, um, onto running on an actual uh, satellite set-top box. All right, so uh, WebGL, um, let's get into it. Um, if you're not familiar, WebGL is an, and gives you an interface to OpenGL. It lets you um, do a lot of the, take advantage of OpenGL, and you get to paint directly to a WebGL canvas within a browser. Um, it's kind of the first, uh, first time that there was sort of a plug-in through free 3D that you could do in a browser without having to use um, some sort of third-party plug-in. Uh, it uh, lets you take advantage of GPU accelerated physics and uh, image processing, and it also um, lets you, in addition, write your own code and program directly to the GPU. It's called shader coding. and allows you to write your own custom effects. So you can do some pretty cool things. I'll show you uh, an example of that in a, shortly. Uh, the biggest problem, I think, with WebGL right now is that it's not easy to use. It's a very low-level API. It's a C-like language. And um, so it's not friendly to, um, to JavaScript developers at all. Uh, there's no markup language. So when you're working in this, you need to handle all of, um, all of your layout. Um, makes things like laying out text, images, and stuff, which if you were used to developing with HTML was handled by the browser for you. You don't get that support. Um, how do we make this easier? There are um, several frameworks out there right now, and more are probably coming out and becoming better at it that, that simplify this process. 3JS is probably one of the first. Um, Famous has come out. They do HTML and they do um, WebGL, and Babylon is another one. This um, makes, make, reduces development time dramatically. Uh, the other um, thing they came up with is for the layout, um, because through an ultra, I had a templating system using HTML, which I really liked. Um, how could I use, create something like that um, to run in a WebGL interface? And I came up with an S, using SVG this time, um, uh, where I would bind SVG to, uh, to, an, um, to a snippet of, um, bind data to a snippet of SVG, and then I would take that and paint it uh, to, a, um, uh, to a 2D canvas, which then comply to a, um, to a 3D, um, Three piece of 3D geometry. So I, I showed earlier um, how HTML templating works. So this is a diagram of how the SVG fits in. It's almost identical. Um, you'll see right, this, right the only difference is that the skin package is now only consists of a snippet of SVG. And the other difference is that when the template utility, instead of inserting that HTML to DOM, takes that SVG and paints it onto a 2D canvas and then takes that, text, takes that image and uses it as a texture to apply to 3D geometry. Otherwise, it functions exactly the same. And this made it very easy when switching over to WebGL. I only had to change a couple classes, and I could keep the rest of my code for Ultra. Um, I'm going to go back and come back out of here and show a couple examples. I didn't show this earlier. Uh, I kind of forgot. Um, but this is an example of how the HTML templating works. Um, so right here is the Ultra engine. Right now, I've simplified it so I can just sort of add and paint sprites onto the screen. And, you know, throw a whole bunch up onto there. I can do two things. I can add and remove sprites, and I can make them transition between two positions. And you can see as, as that happens, the total sprite count as it increases and the frame, frames per second as that happens, you can see how it changes over as it gets more complicated. I use this for testing when we're designing uh, UIs for different platforms. We can set it up in the platform, and I can tell Alex, OK, this is reasonably how many sprites you have to work with. So again, same engine here, but using switching it now to using the SVG, using SVG and um, that other method I described, you can see we can have the, almost the exact same effect. Um, Oops, I hit the wrong one. Do that again. Exact same effect. But right now, this is a WebGL canvas. Right now, all those things, when we call, do the call to render, it's now going, grabbing the SVG file, taking that, drawing it out on a 2D canvas, and then painting it onto the 3D geometry. And you can see that it works. Um, 
very well. It's not quite as fast as CSS and HTML with that process because of the added step of having to paint to that 2D texture. But it's fast enough, and generally you don't need, you know, you don't need like a, you know, 500 items to make a UI. So. So kind of to bring this all together, how does, um, like what can we do? This, this whole slideshow is actually written in the same process. These, are, these uh, slides are all SVG files that are being dynam dynamically updated from a model and then rendered to the screen as I move back and forth through them. And, um, and also to prove that, I can take this and I can transform. So what I've done here is I've taken one giant sprite and I've applied um, Two things I've done: a, I've taken that sprite and I've decided, I've split it up into this grid. I've also taken the textures between uh, that one giant slide and each of these individual one, and I provide uh, applied a morphing algorithm, which I've written in shader code to make that transition. Now that we've have things broken up, I can then use the same engine to move these things around in 3D space by ch by changing the formation. I can also do that morphing transition, morph between that texture and also a video. It's the same thing, I'm taking the individual video textures and applying them. I can break that up again and I can move them around in 3D space. I can make a little visualizer by animating them to the audio. I'm showing off right now. And then, of course, I can bring it back into a full screen video and bring it back into our sprites. And I can go right back into our slideshow and morph us right back. So I think this just to illustrate a lot of the power now with WebGL, this is something that wouldn't really be possible with HTML, uh, but is something that is very possible with, with WebGL. And it's pretty exciting because there's way, far more things we can add, like particle effects. Just everything that you've kind of seen in a 3D video game is now sort of possible uh, with WebGL. Um, and that I'm, I'm going to conclude my side and, and open it up to questions. What is, what is Oh. I mean, because what GL's got to, right? I mean, forgive me if I'm not speaking the right technical terms, but it has to run within a container. I mean, you can't just. Yeah, it's a, yeah, there's a WebGL canvas, right? I mean, a WebGL canvas element within the, within the browser. Within. I couldn't. Okay. Really, what browser is supported? Um, most of the major ones, I'm using WebKit. Uh, but okay. yeah. Uh, Internet Explorer, I don't know if it supports it yet, but definitely WebKit and um, yeah, Firefox. Uh, Chrome, yeah, WebKit browsers do. And that, uh, this is, uh, I'm running this in, in a Chrome browser right now. Um, I can also run it in our, we have our own WebKit browser for running on the set-top box and it run, runs it as well. Uh, you guys made some modifications to that browser? No, no. Out of the box? No, just pretty, this is out of the box, yeah. Cool. yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, WebKit is written for right now. We can target our browser, um, and it's not it's not not efficient to sit there and write for every, <laughs> nor is it needed, especially on a on a on a TV system where you're gonna you're gonna have your own target browser to write to. So, and also the one that we we push is a WebKit browser as well. So, it, I can, writing here on on a Chrome WebKit, it, I can it ports almost almost exactly over to our um, to our system one. It, this is called Gravity Ultra. Gravity Ultra. Gravity is our kind of uh, user interface package, and we have a different set of interfaces. Depend, you know, we have our kind of real solution for our current low-end boxes that we deploy throughout in different countries throughout the world. This is kind of our high-end offering, which we're currently getting onto a set-top box, and, and we call it the uh, Ultra line. Hmm? So it seemed like you were using. Uh Um, channels could be stacks, so anything could be a stack, whether, whether it's a channel, uh, you can have sh stacks of shows, stacks of friends, photo stacks, music stacks, but um, stacks are kind of the, the, the main component. So they're not two different things. You, a channel could be, could, you could have uh, a stack that's made up of channels. Okay. Uh, 
process question. So, like, as you guys evolve sort of from the, C, the HTML, CSS, to the SVG graphics, would, like, typically you give assets and you do it, and like, are there any changes in, in the workflow? The biggest change in the, in the, in the asset is just the, the size. So one of the biggest hurdles that we came across here is like for music, for example, we're, we're navigating 720 by 720 um, album covers. So finding that metadata, is, it's not very common. You know, you look at the Grace Note, TMS, et cetera. They're starting to, they're starting to provide a lot more kind of um, high-res image metadata, but it's not, it's not a full catalog. So oh. there's definitely kind of holes in there. And we're seeing it, you know, especially in the, in the last year or two, it's, becoming, it's improving greatly, which is the good news. So, this kind of interface, it was, to be honest, that was one of our big fears at the beginning was it's, it's, there's no text, it's all image based. So if you don't have the metadata to support that, man, you have a bunch of holes and a bunch of you know, those generic, like this is just the comedy images. So we were able to kind of, we had the luxury of working around that, but we are noticing that the metadata providers are starting to provide more high res metadata. Sure, so we actually, um, we don't have any examples in this interface, but one of the ones that we're adding for the update is in that first view that you saw where everything, we call it our float view, where when you, the passive experience at the beginning where it's all in 3D and things are coming to the center. We were thinking, you know, one of those would, you know, every fifth one could be, you know, maybe there's a Mercedes ad that kind of floats in and it starts playing the commercial for the latest, latest product. So things like that where it's kind of seamlessly integrated into the flow of your, of your con content strip. And they can be, the same thing can be uh, inserted into the stacks themselves as an icon, um, mm -hmm. can sit there and float. We also have looked at um, uh, when things are also displayed in a list view, um, having them partially off to the side. There's a lot of different ways you can insert. And I think what you've got is really just fantastic. I mean, you guys did a great job. Um, how, much is, how much is cash on locally here? It's very snappy. I was really impressed by that. Yeah, it's a lot of it cash locally here, or are you, are you wanting to uh, for this demo, yes, we're caching everything locally. And uh, the thing is, for a lot of the initial content, I think this UI would work best if you were caching, because a lot of the stuff, the catalogs at least aren't, at least the initial queries, that content is not gonna change um, you know, every, every minute, every hour. So certain things can be just like your, um, your EPG guide data doesn't have to be updated. Every, there can be a call every you know, in the middle of the night every day to grab down the program information for that time. You can store the relevant stuff there. Same with the VOD catalog, the initial things. Um, the other parts of it, when you want to go out and do greater queries, yeah, it doesn't make sense to cache that. You're going to have to go out and make, make queries. Um, there will be a load time, just like with any internet application where you make the call. I think it's just a matter of, um, we don't have it demonstrated in this user interface, but making the user aware that they've selected to make a query to go out and get new content depending on your internet connection, there's a slight wait, and then it comes back, and then you have your, your full catalog. And we also do see this as kind of a high-end offering, right? Like, we, we don't imagine someone, bless you, we don't imagine someone kind of um, with an 84-inch TV having like a dial-up connection. It's definitely, it's definitely like the early adopter. It's probably gonna be, you know, they got the best set. They probably have the most high-end kind of set-top box out there, and they're also probably gonna have a nice, really fast internet connection. So we're kind of hoping that that's one of the, you know, it's, it's, it's a really high-end package. But at the same time, you know, there's definitely like, yeah, for an on-demand catalog, you know, you, don't, you definitely maybe once a day, movies are updated. So may, I, I'm sure the first time you load up this interface, there might be like a, you know, you're gonna be waiting for a little bit for a lot of the content to come in. But then after that point, right. then it's really gonna be kind of more gradual updates for, for new content. Yeah, and to get into nuance, so then I start worrying about breaking the cache, right? And you want to push something down, how do you break it elegantly? So uh, you don't, you know, screw up the UI with something that may not be there anymore. All oh, right. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, no. That's, that's, I think it's a very relevant question. No, I mean these are very. These, that that part is very important to the UI, and the UI definitely needs to accommodate it, right? So. Yeah. Sure. So one of the other ones that we're looking at that's a key one would be search. Um, we don't actually have a search experience in uh, in this particular uh, build. But it's one of the ones where, you know, it's not necessarily like the Google sponsor results, but it, there's a similar concept where, you know, always kind of above the fold, the first, one of the first things you see, like, could be kind of um, sponsorships. And then also with recommendations, like, you know, operators 
really love to push, especially with on-demand. Like there's always the new movies that come out that they're trying to sell. So you could see maybe like the first stack is not necessarily action, but maybe it's like recommended. By, and that recommended could be by the operator. So we're really thinking about how the first things that you see could be the ones that are maybe a little more promotional. We also have, a, we don't do it here, but we have a companion device demo with this. And there's a, a definitely opportunity while you don't necessarily see if the person does have a companion device uh, uh, registered with the system, uh, advertisements related to the content they're watching could be pushed to the companion device. So what's the uh, price of the selling these days? <laughs> <laughs> For you, 14000 <laughs> <laughs> um, when we when we we actually bought the set, it was 25, 25 grand, and uh, that was a year and a little half more ago. than a year ago. Yeah. yeah, a little more than a year ago, and the latest model that we we actually have another 4K TV that we bought recently, which is an LG, which I actually think is just as good as this one. Hopefully, there's no one from Sony in the room. Um, we got for under 10, oh, so okay. big price drop. I mean, it's still it's still not something I'm buying from my house, but in about two years, I mean, if if you can get a TV this size for like 5,000, I think that it gets to the point where it really becomes something. But even more importantly, the thing that really has to catch up is the content. There's like, I mean, you can see even in this demo, like most of the things that we're able to find in 4K is in nature. There aren't even 4K players it's, yet. It's, it's so. a lot, it's really hard to find 4K content right now, but it's, it's kind of, um, I think in about two, three years, it's, that's gonna change. Like the World Cup is gonna be broadcast in 4K and I think, uh, you know, a lot more kind of operators out there are gonna start broadcasting in 4K. So I think like 2015, maybe 2016 is gonna be the sweet spot for the price of the set and the amount of content that you'll be able to watch coming together. Do you know the World Cup will be uh, Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm not uh, sure if it's every match, but um, I know that it, it is. Uh, I can't remember which. Uh, it's. Was, I can't remember which operator it is that's broadcasting it, but definitely, I think it's. Is it net? I think net. It, it's net. They have a closed system. Probably there <laughs> might be hundreds of subscribers actually, but they so do it's have. Not, so I don't think in the U.S. But I'm, but I'm pretty sure that, yeah, Net Brazil is gonna be broadcasting in 4K out there. So the four people in Brazil that have a 4K TV are gonna be happy, <laughs> happy campers. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they'll charge for admission to come over to the house and have 100 people over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, I mean, we haven't done that with this, but I, I'm a big fan of that model, it's especially for in terms of kind of updates to the interface where you're not, I mean, in our world, like, um, especially like, you know, two, three years ago, like updating an interface that was on a set-top box that wasn't in the cloud, sometimes it's like a six-month cycle, and you're like, man, I just want to update, like, maybe you have a new logo and you want to do a couple of things, and it's like, you have to wait so long, so really putting your interface in the cloud is one of those things to me, especially as a UX guy, is like, it's a big, it's a big leap. I really feel like, you know, you can do things quickly, and that's what it's all about here, so. I'm a big fan of that. Sure. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. I hope uh, it was it was uh, educational and uh, fun.